Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Argelia Lawrence, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today as part of this uh, Arkansas Science Festival. Uh, the topic I would like to talk to you about is the importance of plants and how heat affects them, and how we can um, help develop rice varieties that are more tolerant to stresses. So, a little reminder, why are plants important? Just remember, they provide the oxygen that we need to breathe, and they are really the basis of all um, food uh, chains. They um, use the light uh, from the sun and carbon dioxide, and, uh, and they release oxygen that we absolutely need to breathe. They are uh, absolutely essential. So if you want uh, a fun way to remember why plants are important, I invite you to think about the letter F. Plants provide food, like the delicious fruits and vegetables that I'm illustrating in this slide. They also provide feed for animals. Uh, believe it or not, now we're using uh, plants also to make fuels, not only for cars or your school bus, as illustrated in the slide, but also even for jets, right? So plants also provide us with fiber. And this uh, photograph that I have here uh, of the cotton plant should be very familiar to you because we have a lot of this crop here in Arkansas. Of course, plants produce these beautiful flowers that in addition to give us beauty, they provide frag fragrances um, that uh, we use widely. Uh, plants also, of course, many of them have medicinal properties. And of course, also, plants can give us pleasure and fun. And I'm illustrating here chocolate. I don't know you, but I absolutely love chocolate. That's one of my favorite plants, the cocoa plant. So I'm going to invite you to look around your house for either plants or plant products that you may have. I did that this morning. So I'm gonna show you what I found like in less than five minutes in my house. I'm gonna show you. So in terms of food, I found this delicious bag of yellow rice. Love yellow rice. Mm, so yummy and smells so nice. In terms of feed, I found some corn seeds that we feed birds. But maybe you find, maybe you have a duck or a turtle or a doggy or a cat. And all of them like also plant-based products. Plants also give us fuel and I found uh, I borrowed this little toy from my 11 year old, like many of you, he's into video games. And this is Luigi in his little car, uh, ready to go around. So the fuel that powers the cars that allows us to move people and also goods. In terms of uh, an illustration of how plants produce fiber, we all love our cotton shirt. And this is one of my favorites. I guess that by now you uh, can very easily guess which is one of my super favorite plants in the world, rice. I love rice. In terms of flowers, I want to remind you, in addition to being beautiful, they give us these fragrances that we enjoy every day. So I don't know you, but I don't feel fully dressed if I don't use a little perfume every morning. In terms of contributing to our health and fitness, I want to show you as an example uh, an essential oil. I'm showing you here eucalyptus. So in addition to making your home smell really nice, 
this plant has medicinal properties. I also, for example, love lavender as an essential oil to calm, to calm down when I'm stressed. And as a last example of things that I found in my home, uh, I want to show you that for fun, again, chocolate and, uh, from the cocoa plant, one of my favorite plants to have fun with. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that if you look around your home, you're also going to find uh, lots and lots of plants and plant-based products. Maybe in the cereal you uh, ate, uh, you eat every morning, you can, you're going to find that many of them are made with wheat, with rice, with corn, with oats. Again, plants are very, very important. So one thing that people are not very um, many times aware of is the fact that as us humans, plants also get stressed. They experience stress for different reasons than we do. They experience stress, for example, because there is excess of rain or too much heat or too much, um, too little water. Uh, all of these produce uh, stress in plants and these stresses have consequences. So plant scientists, we are always, like doctors do, uh, they are always trying to improve our health. We plant scientists are always trying to contribute to solving some of the important issues and problems we have. So one of the issues and problems we have, I'm showing you here a graph that shows the average air temperature between 80, 1880 and 2015. And as you can see on the blue line, and also the red line on the left part of the graph, you can see that the global air temperature has been steadily increasing. So in, other, in simple terms, Earth is getting hotter. So how do crops react to this stress? Well, remember, they cannot just run away and they cannot just turn on their conditioning like you and I do on a daily basis. So I'm showing you here on the right examples of how some common crops respond to heat. Uh, so I'm showing, for example, that some crops don't care much about uh, the change in temperature, like alfalfa. Uh, pretty much with or without heat, alfalfa is pretty um, happy. However, there are other crops, and all of the major crops included, that are heavily affected by heat. For example, maize, rice, wheat, cotton, another very important crop for us in Arkansas. So again, heat matters. And it turns out that if you compare the speed at which day temperature has increased versus the night temperature, the one that is in, uh, increasing faster is the night temperature. So knowing this, uh, and knowing how important rice is around the world, uh, a group of us are trying to find ways to, uh, again, help breeders develop new varieties of rice that are able to thrive on, under these very challenging conditions. So the map that I'm showing you right now corresponds to all of the places on earth where rice was grown in 2018. And the stronger the blue color, the more production. So as you can see, Asia is a big area of production, but also many other areas of the world. So how, what about the US? Well, it turns out rice is very important in the US. There is six states that grow rice heavily, but guess what? Arkansas is number one. Arkansas is the main rice producer in the US, and rice contributes $6 billion to the Arkansas economy. So the, I guess the big problem that some of us are trying to contribute solutions to is how can we keep the Arkansas farmers able to still produce a lot of rice in a 
every, uh, every uh, uh, in a world where the temperature is increasing, both during the day and during the night. So, uh, again, with a group of colleagues, we thought that nature most likely can provide the answer. I already showed you that uh, rice is grown all over the world. Well, it turns out that there are resources for rice research that can contribute uh, in this case. And I'm gonna show you right here, right behind me. You see, uh, I have here a collection of more than 310 rice varieties. These varieties come from many different regions of the world. In fact, I'm uh, in this map here, I'm showing how many varieties from each region. So here we have rice, 312 different rice varieties. And as you can see, there are some that are, have darker seeds, there are some that have smaller seeds, there are some that are bigger seeds. And this na natural variation is what we are using to explore and try to find which of those could have tolerance or resilience to this heat stress that I've been telling you about. So uh, in this next slide, I'm showing you the group of people that are collaborating in this project. So uh, I'm working together with colleagues from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, colleagues from the USDA IRS Delta Water Management Unit, colleagues from Kansas State University, colleagues from Virginia Tech, and also our colleagues from Rice Tech. This is a company that produces hybrid rice. They have a state-of-the-art experimental station very close to Jonesboro, Arkansas. In fact, it's in Highway 1 in the way to Harrisburg. And they have been a great partner in this uh, project. They are hosting our research site in this experimental station that they have. If you want to know a little more about our project, I'm listing here our website and also our Facebook and Twitter account. Okay, so the first step that we, have to, uh, we had to accomplish in the project was to build some greenhouses. These gr greenhouses are the key infrastructure we're using to test which of these 320 dif uh, different varieties are tolerant to heat? So it turns out that when we bought these greenhouses, they came as Lego pieces, as you can see here in this photograph. They came disassembled, and then we had to learn how to put them together. And it's really thanks to the effort of a great uh, team of students and staff that we were able to accomplish this task. It took um, several months to accomplish during the summer of 2019. Uh, it took exactly 8,000 man hours. Uh, but as you can see, we were able to assemble the metal structures then put the plastic on the greenhouses. And at the end, we had six beautiful greenhouses. Three of them to keep at normal temperature and three of them to heat on purpose only when the plants are flowering. Uh, there are two features that are absolutely key for these greenhouses. They are mobile. We can pull them with tractors like you see in that uh, photograph that I'm showing you. So that's one uh, distinction of these greenhouses. The other characteristic is the roof and also the walls uh, open. Because it's very important that during the day, plants are exposed to that sunlight that we said they need for photosynthesis, and then we close these greenhouses during the night. And that's when we keep three of them at normal temperature and three of them we heat on purpose. So again, I'm showing you here a photo of the six, green, the six beautiful greenhouses. And here is data from our 2019 season. These are uh, the temperature recordings of the 14 nights when we subjected those plants to heat stress. The blue lines are the temperature in the greenhouses that were kept at normal temperature, and the red lines are the temperature registered inside the greenhouses 
that we hit it on purpose. And as you can see, we achieved what we wanted, which was a temperature in the heated greenhouses that was four degrees Celsius higher than the one of the control greenhouses. In science, it's always important to have a control and a treatment group. I'm pretty sure you have learned that in school. So this uh, is a complex project because uh, we are growing, uh, again, a large uh, number of different uh, varieties, 320. We had to plant them by hand and also harvest them by hand transport them to our greenhouse where we uh, dry the plant material and then take very careful measurements like I'm showing in the photographs here where we plant, uh, where we record things like how tall the plants were, how many uh, branches or tillers they had, and of course how much seed they produced. Because what we are going after again is which rice varieties are able to thrive to keep the high yield, even though they were exposed to this heat stress. So uh, we not only do uh, plant level measurements but, um, and yield measurements, but also we dehusk the seeds and we uh, acquire images from uh, these seeds to be able to, to quantify things such as how, how long the grains are or how wide they are. Uh, because these are important parameters that can help us find those varieties that are tolerant, again, to this stress. So uh, 2019 was a great season, and we were successful at finding some of these varieties that are tolerant to stress. But uh, in science, you always need to prove that you are able to reproduce results. So uh, in 2020, we had to repeat the experiment all over again we had some challenges. In addition to COVID that we all are experiencing, we had a tornado. So we went from these beautiful greenhouses to greenhouses that have their roof completely damaged. So this 2020 season, we had to do a lot of repairs. And I'm showing you here in the photographs that appear in the uh, bottom right corner, how the team worked again in replacing the um, 400 um, pounds of damaged plastic to make the greenhouses operational again. So uh, I'm happy to report you that uh, the 2020 season has been a success. Uh, the, the team is in the process of completing harvest and we're gonna to proceed to the very careful uh, measurements. I love this photograph where you can see the healthy crop and the greenhouses and a beautiful sunset in the background. Of course, a project this complex can only be possible with the work of very talented people. And I'm uh, listing them here. Our two leaders are Wensi Larazzo, who's a rice agronomist, and Shay Harris, who is the outreach coordinator here at Arkansas, uh, the Arkansas Biosciences Institute, and also is the outreach coordinator for this project. It turns out that he has amazing talent in construction and in many other things. Uh, so he's my right hand whenever anything happens to those greenhouses. Without Shay, the project would not be possible. Uh, very talented uh, PhD students, master's students, and a lot of undergrads and even high school students, Andre Monsalud, Atom Borbe, and Matt Luster, uh, they join us when they were still uh, high school students. We are also very grateful to the support we always get from Arkansas State University and the Arkansas Biosciences Institute and to our partners from Rice Tech in particular, Dr. Rosti, Rosti Bautista and Mr. Mason Wallace. And with that, I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. And uh, uh, before we uh, finish, I would like to show you a very nice model of the greenhouses that Wensi Larazzo built. I want to show you this beautiful model that Wensi made for us. So 
again, it's very important the two characteristics that I told you about the greenhouses, they are mobile, we can pull them with tractors, and also the roofs and also the walls roll up and down. So during the day, the roofs and also the walls are up so that the plants can use the sunlight. But at night, the team goes to the field and rolls down the walls. I'm gonna do that for you all the walls and also the roofs. We do this with motors and using also um, batteries. Motors and batteries. So we close again the all four walls and the two roofs. That process takes approximately half an hour to do it for all six greenhouses. And once we complete that process, is when the heaters are activated to be able to, again, only when the plants are flowering, provide that uh, stress treatment. Uh, and as you can see uh, in the model, uh, there are plants growing inside and also some other growing outside to avoid um, having artifacts due to uh, not having a neighboring plant around, what we call border effects. Then the next morning the team comes, turn the heaters off and then rolls up again all four walls and the roofs to start the process all over again. So that's the process.